Praise the Lord. He is that, amen? All that we need. Did you notice this morning, Brother Joe's not here. He has the distinct privilege and honored this morning to be uh, at his granddaughter Breeley's baptism service. And praise the Lord, I, I told him I'd be there if my granddaughter was getting baptized. I'd, not to, not to be ashamed of that. That's Man, I, I know that's going to mean so much to her and the family. So he's getting that privilege this morning, but we're not going to miss a lick with the book of James as we continue on in, in that book and walk through it and see what it says to us. It's been hitting us pretty hard. Uh, the book of James kind of reminds me of that uh, court case of that small country town that had a southern court case going on and so it was the first day of the trial and the first witness called was Miss Jones. And so the, the prosecuting attorney introduces and says, Miss Jones, do you know who I am? Do you know me? She said, yeah, I know you. Mr. Williams said, I've known you since you've been a little boy. And to be honest with you, I'm very disappointed in you. You lie, you cheat on your wife. Said you manipulate people. You talk about people behind their back. Yeah, I know you. Man, the prosecuting attorney about had a cow. He didn't know what to do. All he could think of was pointing over to the defense attorney and say, well, do you know the defense attorney here in this courtroom? He said, I sure do. Mr. Bradley, I've known him since he's been a little boy. And he disappoints me as well. He's a racist. He's, he's, he's a terrible lawyer, worst law firm in town. He's a drunkard. Said, and he cheats on his wife. He's cheated on three women, one of which is your wife. And boy, the defense attorney wants to crawl underneath the table. And so the judge motions the two attorneys to come to him. The judge sits and leans over and whispers and said, Listen, guys, if either of you two ask her if she knows me, I'm going to send you to the electric chair. <laughs> you know, it, it's almost like James says, Do I know you? Because if you've been like me all through this book, it's like he knows us. He knows this front and back because every topic this book has hit has just been right on to where we are. Like he's, the old saying, reading our mail. Uh, he seems to be doing that in each and every lesson. So this morning we're going to be kind of looking at, uh, as Brother Joy mentioned on his last more verses and we can really cover well. We're going to hit the last part of this kind of quickly. We're looking at James 4, 13 through 5 and 6. Really looking at two topics following God's will and the judgment that awaits the wicked wealthy. We're going to see about this use and misuse of money uh, as well. So these are the two topics that James covers in this small portion of Scripture here that we're going to look at this morning. First of all, let's look at following God's will. James says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Indeed, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is evil. Therefore, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin." So let's break this little passage down to where I believe James is telling us, I think, three important aspects to motivate us this morning to say, you know, I want to do God's will. I want to do what God says do. First of all, I believe it tells us explicitly, follow God's will because our plans, our wisdom is just too unsure. He starts out with this one passage, come now, the word come now, it really has to do in the Greek there is pay attention, get this, and know what I'm about to tell you, listen carefully, kind of a warning bell to say, and of course you think, well, shouldn't all scripture be like that? It is, but there's this certain urge of uniqueness, this urge of passion, this urge of warning that he says, listen up. This is so important what I'm about to say, as if maybe they were kind of dozing off up to this point, maybe this letter had been getting a little long and the church is saying, hey, we've heard enough. And maybe he said, no, listen up because I'm about to tell you. And then when he says, you who say it, in the, in the Greek it has to do with, you are in the habit of doing this. He's telling the church members, look, many of you are in the habit of doing what I'm about to say. 
You don't just do it every now and then. Your lifestyle is this, and you need to stop it. So what is that? Well, he goes on to say, which we just read these things, so let's break this down. Now, when we look at this, we may not, it may not jump off the pages, but let's go back to the time when it was written. During this era, people were developing new cities all over the place. They were popping up left and right, and these new cities wanted new citizens to populate the cities, and they wanted people to start new businesses in those cities. Because what's a city without business? So they were, they were begging people to come, hoping people would come to their brand new cities to start a new business. More than likely, the person he's referring to here has, the, has a map open. And he's kind of looking at this map and looking maybe at a city and saying, you know what? I want to be one of those people to go to, the, to one of those cities and I want to be one of those people to start one of these businesses in these new establishments that are in the region of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. Whatever these new cities around that area that are popping up, I want to be on the inn. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. But there is going to be some to what he addresses here. First of all, did you notice what this guy says? First of all, he's talking about a future time. I'm going to do this Either the rest of the day or tomorrow, that's when I'm going to go. I'm going to go to that city probably tomorrow. And he's talking about a future location, to such and such a city. He names a city probably. This James kind of uses a generic such and such a city. So he's already talked about this future location that he's going to go to. And then he talks about a future length of stay. He's going to stay there. I'm going to stay there one year. And he talks about an objective. Hey, I'm going to start a business. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to that city and I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to start a business. And I already know my result. I'm going to make a profit. And you say, well, what's wrong with that? I don't see God in there anywhere. On the surface, there's nothing wrong with that. But Paul, uh, uh, James is saying there is plenty, plenty wrong with this. You say, well, Brother Tim, is it wrong to make plans? I mean, we're thinking about a vacation next month and we're already making plans. No, no. It's not wrong to make plans. It's wrong to make plans without consulting God. That's what he's saying. You don't know what tomorrow's even gonna hold. You don't know if you'll be alive tomorrow. And look at all these things he's already saying definitely will happen. I'm definitely gonna do it tomorrow. I'm definitely gonna go to this location. I'm definitely gonna stay this long. I'm definitely gonna have this business and I'm definitely gonna make a profit. Well, not if God drops you dead tomorrow. You're not going to do any of that. Or if, you get, if he allows you to get a disease, you won't be doing all that. Or if you wreck your camel on the way there, you know, get whiplash. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen because you and I don't know the future. And if we knew the future, then yeah. But raise your hand if, you're, if you know the future for sure. You don't. I don't. So it's not wrong to make some plans, but you say this. Lord, is this your will? Is this what you want me to do? Is this where you want me to go? Is this the business you want me to start? And I gotta leave the results to you because I, I just don't know what's going on. And then James adds this little deal. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. We don't have enough brain power. You know why we don't have enough brain power? Because we don't know the future. If we only knew the future then everything would be fine. But because the future is uncertain, I don't care how much brain power, education, university training, experience you have, it's not enough if you don't know the future because it's, it's a lack of information. Not only that, even when you go by your own heart and your own, say, I'm just going to go with my heart. The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So I can't just go with my gut because a lot of times my guts, my heart, is deceitful and wicked. So I'm saying, I'm just going to go with how I feel. Well, that, that usually doesn't work, right? Because I know my feelings are desperate. My heart can deceive me. Well, I'll just go with the way that seems right. Well, the Bible goes with that one too. There's a way that seems right to the man, in a man, but the end is death. So go with your gut and go with what you think's right. Both of those say, uh-uh. Those don't help. I say, well, man, I... Uh, what's, what am I going to do here? I like what Adrian Rogers says. 
He wrote, God will choose something for you that you would choose for yourself if you had enough sense to choose it. I like that. That's what God's picking for. You know, we always think, oh no, God's gonna want something bad for me. Don't do what God wants, you're gonna be miserable. He's gonna send you to the deepest, darkest part of Africa and you'll be miserable and be, have your head chopped off. I mean, that's what people think about God. He's gonna make my life miserable. When God's gonna give you what you would really pick yourself if we had enough sense to know what to do, but God does have enough sense. He does have enough wisdom. He does have enough knowledge. And if you didn't know this, he's already in the future. That's why he called himself I am. Not I was and I is, but I am. I'm all the time. I'm in the past, present, future, all at once. Do you know that? He's in the past, present, and future at once. He's already down there and back there and there. Time's nothing to him. He's, he's, he's all the time everywhere. But here's our... Here's where we mess up. You say, Brother Tim, I thought about it. And here's what I'm gonna do. Well, thinking about it's not enough because we're still gonna be limited in what we know. You know, at one time people thought, let me put it this way, our problem is that all we know is what we know. But we don't know what it is we don't know, you know? Isn't that correct? You say, I know a lot. That's good. But you don't know what it is you don't know. Because you don't know what you don't know. And that's where we mess up. You know all the facts, but you only know all the facts that are existent. You know, at one time, thought people thought they were pretty smart when they, when they found a, a piece of continent on earth. They said, I've discovered a continent I've discovered a piece of land nobody on earth knew. Boy, I'm smart. And then they realized that this isn't the only planet. Yeah, you discovered a piece of land on this planet, but this isn't the only planet. Later on, they discover we got plenty of planets. And people were, thought they were real wise when they said, look, we've discovered we have planets. Until somebody else later on discovered, that's nothing. There's a galaxy that this earth is just part of a galaxy called the Milky Way Galaxy of which just to the end of that is two million light years away, is our next closest galaxy, the Andromeda. The next closest galaxy to the Milky Way galaxy of which we live in is two million light years away, Andromeda. And then just recently in 2012, they found out that we have, according to the Hubble telescope, they found out the furthest galaxy that has been seen thus far by mankind. They gave it a name, but it has a bunch of numbers to it. And they said this galaxy that was seen is 13 billion light years away. You know how long a light year is? It's 186,000 miles per second away. 186,000 miles a second. If you were traveling that fast, you could go around the earth seven and a half times in a second. That means the light from this galaxy that they saw, when the light leaves that planet, it would appear on earth 13 billion years later. That's how far away that is. That light traveling 186,000 miles an hour would appear 13 billion years later. And we think we know it all. That's just the next galaxy that they've seen. But guess what? In another 10 years of Jesus, that game, they're going to find more and more and more. And God's going to have not even shown it all to them. You know why I believe God allowed that to happen this last couple of years? To show mankind, look, you don't know anything. You only know what you know. And you only know what I've already shown you. But there's so much more out there. We're just a speck. I don't know about you, I'm not going to be alive when that, uh, that beam finally gets here from that galaxy. But it reminds us, we don't know much. You can brag about your college. You can brag about your experience. You can brag about your know-how. You can brag about your previous good decisions. But it's still not enough. You've got to say, God, what is your will? 
It's kind of like that 18 or 19 year old that says, I'm going to go out on my own and they don't believe their parents know enough. Like they can say, you know, I've got 18 years experience. <clears throat> oh, wow, 18 years experience. Whoa, that's a lot of experience. Boy, you really can make your decisions well on your own. Yeah, right. We can have 70 years experience, but if we don't consult God, that's not enough wisdom. You do not know, James says. You don't have enough capacity. The reason is because you don't know what the future holds. If you knew what the future holds, then you could back up and say, here's what I need to do to make a decision because that's what's going to happen tomorrow and next week and next month. But guess who already knows that? God. And when you consult God, God says, well, let me look down there. Well, he don't even have to look down there. He's already down there. And being that I'm already down there, here's what you ought to be doing because that's what you're going to meet in one year, two years, five years. And you better make the right decision because if you don't, you can really mess things up. It's kind of like the kid that says, you know, I want to be a doctor. Nothing wrong with wanting to be a doctor. Have you consulted God? No, I want to be a doctor. And he goes through all that 10 years of training, gets out in the profession and hates it and quits. Maybe if he had consulted God, God would have said, you won't like this. And here's the direction you need to go that will bring fulfillment to your life. See, God's not looking to destroy us. He's looking to fulfill the purpose he has for us. You know, second thing he gives here, he says, I believe he wants to follow God's, God's will because life's too short. He says it's like a vapor that appears a little while and vanishes away. Life is just so short. Now, you may not think that, young people. You said, oh, no, life's got a long way ahead. Let me put it this way. Life's only as long in perspective. This morning, if you're 18 years old and you're going to die at 24, you're an old person. And this morning, if you're 45 and you live to be 100, you're a young person. It's not how young you are, it's how long you're going to live. You say, Brother Tim, we don't know how long I'm going to live. That's what James is saying. You don't have long enough to figure it out. I've often, my dad used to always say, son, experience is a wonderful teacher. Boy, he was right, but I think by the time I get it, I'll be 96. You know, I just, you know, I will say, I got it. I got a lot of it now. And then boom, I'm dead. You know, I'll be able to use it three days. You know, <laughs> we just can't wait for that experience. Yes, experience is a wonderful teacher. And yes, you learn a lot through experience. But he's saying, you cannot wait for that. Life is just too short. And if you're going to wait, and a lot of people say, I'm just going to go ahead and sow my oats and try a little wild things, you know, because I've been raised in church and I'm, I need to do a little wild oats. You don't have time for wild oats. God doesn't want you to do wild oats. And during the wild oats, you may destroy your life. Life is short, and we need to find out what God wants, not what I want. I was following a vehicle the other day, and it said, Life short, fish hard. I thought I was following Alan Waldrop, but it wasn't his vehicle. You know, I thought if James had a bumper sticker on his camel, it would say, life short, follow God's will. You better follow God's will in every decision that we face. And then we know that Ecclesiastes says, moreover, man does not know his time. If you only knew your time. If God, when you were born, said, you know, here's the day you're going to die. Well, would you live life different? If he gave you the exact date, but Ecclesiastes and the wisdom of that book said, you just don't know your time, so you better find out what God wants to seek it, to find out, and be about your business. And I believe the third thing he addresses is you need to follow God's will because it's sinfully arrogant if we don't. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. What do we say? Do we not plan? No. We say, you know, if the Lord wills, that's what I want to do. If that's what he wants, then that's what I'm going to do. If that's not what he wants, then that's not what I'm going to do. That's how you pre-plan. You say, here's what I've got laid out. Lord, is this what you want? 
A lot of people think God has his will kind of like Easter eggs. He hides them so well you can't find it. I think there's people like that. I'm really trying to find God's will. God wants us to know his will as much or more than we want to know his will. He's not hiding them like Easter eggs. He wants to show us what it is. So just say this, if the Lord wills. That guy could have said, if the Lord wills, I'm going to go to this city. If the Lord wills, I'm going to stay a year. If the Lord wills, I'm going to start a business. If the Lord wills, you know, that's what he should have said in that analogy that James gave. But he didn't say any of that. You say, yeah, but I know what makes me happy. Ecclesiastes also addresses that. You cannot eat, for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? You may have all the money in the world, but if not God is not your God, you can't have the willpower to even enjoy it. There's people with billions that are miserable because God gives you what he gives you, whether big or little, rich or poor, he gives you the ability to enjoy it. And so here, we need to say, Lord, we need to be able to go and do what you ask us to do the way you ask us to do it. And you notice here, in case you missed out on anything else getting hit by James, he discusses in, chapter, in verse 17 what we call theologically the sin of omission. Theologically, he's saying this. During this whole series, he's saying, there are some things that you're doing that you've heard preached about that you need to stop doing. Isn't that what you've been listening to? You've been hearing ver verses on you don't do this and don't do that and you shouldn't be this and you shouldn't be that. And you've got, and I've got, to look at our lives and say, you know, here's some things we need to stop doing. But what he's saying is, it's also a sin in our life if we know there's something that we ought to be doing and we're not doing, that's a sin. That's why I'm just not going out witnessing and I'm not doing that and I'm not going out and serving the Lord and I don't have an area of ministry and I'm not going to do that. But at least I'm not sinning. Praise God. James just did this right in our eyeball. He said, no, that's a sin too. Because to the one who knows to do the right thing to do and he doesn't do it, bingo. That's sin just like the one over there murdering. You say, turn that page, Brother Tim, quick. <laughs> Let's get over to those rich, wicked people. But he hits us right here and says, listen, if there's some things in your life as a Christian that you know you ought to be doing and you're just not doing it, it's sin. And you know what he talks about when we want to do our will instead of God's? He said it's arrogance. He said you boast in your arrogance. You know why that's arrogance? Because you're saying, I'm going to do this. I know God wants that. I know I'm going to do this. I know what God wants me to do something different. But I'm going to be happy and it's going to work out best my way. I've been in the ministry 19 years. I've never heard anybody ever come up to me and say, you know what? I didn't do it God's way. I did it my way and it worked out best. Now, I've had plenty of people say the other, but I've never had Brother Tim, you guys were all wrong. I did it my way, like Frank Sinatra, and it just worked out great. If they ever did say that to me, I'd say, give it just a little more time. <laughs> because God has never been proven wrong once. Once. You know anybody that's never been proven wrong once? Now, none of y'all point at your spouses. And just once? Never. But God, he's never been proven wrong, and that's why we need to follow his will and not our will. And then James kind of turns the corner and he looks at another area about the judgment that awaits the wicked wealthy. Now, before we point to these people and say, well, at least that's not me, I'm not wealthy, we're going to be talking about the use and misuse of money. First of all, he talks about the faith the fate of the wicked wealthy, because a judgment awaits. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl, for your miseries are coming upon you. Now, just like it's not wrong to plan, it's wrong to plan without God, it's not wrong to have a lot of money. There are a lot of wealthy people in the Bible. Solomon to be probably the richest man that ever lived. It is not wrong to have a lot of wealth. It is not wrong to be rich. It is not wrong to have a lot of possessions. I mean, that, that in of itself is not necessarily a sin, but he's going to address these people because these people love money. 
more than they love God. These are people that love their money and their possessions and hoard their possessions and know it's just for them. These are the wicked. And he's talking in a various ways here about their ultimate punishment. You notice he starts this same passage the same way he did with the last topic on God's will. Come now, listen up, pay attention. Same two words, come now. You gotta listen up. Before we tune it out and say, well, I'm not wealthy. I've seen people that have some of the least amount of money love money. And some people that have gobs of money really not love money. So the issue is not the money, it's the love of it. These people have lived this way and their punishment's coming. Weeping and howling. and mis- They're not going to go to hell because of their money. They're going to hell because they love their money more than God and never turn to God for salvation. Those are the only people that will be lost. But we've got to be careful because money turns people away, I believe, sometimes from maybe wanting to be saved. And the ones who are saved, they go the wrong direction because of this issue. Timothy, Paul addressed that to Timothy. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith. They were saved, but they wandered off and pierced themselves with many griefs. So it's also the saved who get a lot of grief from loving money. You know, a man one time told his friend, he said, I don't love money. He said, well, don't you think about money all the time? Yeah. Don't you dream about a lot of money all the time? Yeah. Don't you just long for money? Yes. Wouldn't you just desire money than any other thing? Yes. Then you love money. Because isn't what that's what you did for your first girlfriend? Well, yeah, I long to be with her. Yeah, I guess I do. You see, this causes not only people to veer off, it causes them sometimes to put that as the number one priority in their life. He also went on in verse 17 to say it this way. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. It's uncertain. You may have a lot today and none tomorrow. But on God, listen, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. See, he's not putting down, having it. If God gives it to you and you're faithful with it and you give him his portion and you minister to other people and you love other people and you use your money for his ministry and his hope and you say to him like you did with the other things, what is your will for my money? What is your will for my possessions? He's fine with it because he richly supplies you so you can enjoy it. But these people don't. They're kind of like Jack Benny if you're old enough to know Jack Benny, which I just got the reruns on that. Uh, he, he used to have this little skit, you know, where the guy came up to him, put a gun in his back, to Jack Benny's back, and said, the crook said, your money or your life? There was no response. The guy said, didn't you hear me? I said, your money or your life? Jack Benny said, I heard you the first time, and I'm thinking about it. <laughs> you know, that's where a lot of people's lives will go bad. Your money or your life? I'm thinking about it. And your life got sold out to money. See, it's not the possessing of it. It's, it's, it's possessing you. These w- wicked wealthy, they're kind of futile to do it because they're striving for things that won't last. Your riches have rotted and your garments become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you've stored up your treasure. You know, back in those days, they didn't have 401ks. They didn't have stocks and bonds. They had to have ways to store wealth. And there were three ways to store wealth. Food, that was a a commodity. And so they would store food. Well, that didn't work very well for them because that food rotted. And then garments. You kept expensive garments and you kept them in your house because that was your 401k. You could always sell that later on. That was your way to store wealth. Well, that didn't do them much good because the malls came in there and said, lunch. And they ate your 401k. 
So the mice and the rottenness ate your food. Your moths ate your clothing 401k. And you say, well, that can't happen. Well, back then, the gold and the silver weren't pure. They had a lot of mixture in there. And so it caused that commodity, those precious jewels to rust and rust up and be worth nothing. So these people said, ah, we're storing it up. In one minute, God can unstore it. You say, I'm making big money in a big company. That's why God's giving you health right now to be making it. If he shuts that down, you may not be making any money at any company. You say, well, I've got a great education. Well, God gave you that one. Oh, no, because I had smarts. God gave you that too. Uh, well, he gave me a job to come. That's because he caused the person to show favor upon you. You can't say anything is ours. We can't take credit for anything. Because if we did it and we got it, God did it. And so we go back to saying, why is all that just yours? It's not just yours, it's God's. He's letting us borrow it for a little bit. Because we're passing through. Remember life's a vapor? It's just a pilgrimage. A lot of times things don't make sense in this life because we say, this is it. No, we're just passing through. We're in a tent and just zipping through this life like a vapor which out of a tea kettle goes up in the air and then it goes away. We've got to start looking at this life as a pilgrimage, just passing through for a little second till we get on to eternity, which is a long, long time. You want to store it up? Well, go ahead and store it up because it's all going to be eventually unstored and been away with. And then the last thing James discusses is the frenzy. You know, greed causes people to do some awful things. You've probably experienced that in your life, whether it's been a business or a person or somebody. Greed can cause people to do terrible things. So I don't understand what they did or why they did what they did. And it's right there. Because greed makes people do what they otherwise wouldn't do. He gives one example here, just even cheating people. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, which has been withheld from you, cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. That's the God and his armies. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. Life is good. Well, you think it is. And you fatten your hearts in a day of slaughter. Said you've, you've wanted money so bad, you've even cheated people. They did work for you and you withheld their pay or you cheated them in their pay. You just wanted money so bad that you did some things that were really wrong. And you know what? Those people who cried out, you know who heard their, hear, their voice? God. <laughs> God heard that. And he's not very pleased. These people were day laborers. If they didn't get that pay that day, they didn't eat. And their families didn't eat. And God's, God's not pleased with it. If you've ever been robbed or cheated, God, and you're a child of God, God knows about it. And I'd feel bad for that employer or that person who've done you wrong because you're one of God's children. I don't know about you. One of the worst things that somebody could do to you would be to hurt one of your kids. They could probably slap you and you could turn the other cheek. But they go after your children. I'll just say, you... You may not turn that other cheek so quite so fast because your children mean so much to you. You would, but you're hurting more because they're your children. And here God looks upon these people with great compassion. You know, they also, these rich people, will hurt people by putting, hurting people and putting some to death by the courts. That's probably what this relates to. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man who, dot, who did not resist you. The righteous man, probably referring to a believer. They did this believer wrong. He was a righteous man. And he somehow was taken to court, I believe. He was condemned. He was probably had a lawsuit against him that was wrong. He, and there was so much corruption during the courts back then, which probably even, more, even somewhat today. But they could be bribed. And even some people could have people put to death judicially. And that's what these people, they wanted money so bad, they were willing to condemn or even put to death a righteous person. 
And you know what that righteous person did? They didn't even resist. You know why? Because they said, God's going to take care of this. Because God is my God. But the rich people said, you know what? I want this so bad. You know, this morning, whether it's wealth, money, possessions, whether it's ease or comfort or popularity or the right status in life or what other people are going to think about you, whatever the reason is that we don't do the will of God. And while we don't do and stop doing what God says to stop doing and start doing what we know is right, James is saying, I believe, to all of us, it's time to do an introspection and say, you know what? If God's will is not the most important thing to my life, I need to examine my life and say, why? Because there's really only two choices, His will or my will. You say, I'm kind of in the middle. I kind of like to live in the middle on the fence. Well, that's very uncomfortable. You've got to make a decision. Is my life going to be God's will or my will? Am I going to let all these things dictate me or am I going to dictate what I do and make it God's will? Is God the center of all your decisions? When you make a decision, you say, you know what, I need to consult God and find out what He wants. This morning, a primary focus of all of our lives is, am I right with God in all of these areas? and what I need to stop doing and what it is he's told me to start doing and I keep putting it off. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet,